Hi, welcome to Talking Books and Stuff, the program that talks all about books and writing and stuff. Here's your host, Dennis Rimmer. This is another edition of Talking Books and Writing and Stuff, and today from Thunder Bay, Ontario, we have with us Jacqueline Dacre, and we're going to talk about books and writing and stuff, included horses and perhaps maybe, Jacqueline, your cat, James Bond. How's he doing today? James Bond is stretched out on the sofa next to me, listening. He wants to be on on a podcast. (laughs) <laughs> Maybe we should start a, a cat podcast and they could just meow at each other. <laughs> yeah, he's a character. He, he caught his 11th mouse uh, oh. three nights ago. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah. Under my feet oh. while I'm screaming. <laughs> oh. did, he, did, he, did he devour it? He devoured everything but the tail oh. and a few bones. Yes. <laughs> our, <laughs> our cat, Henry, is the hunter. We have two cats. Henry is the hunter, and he eats them from the head down. Yes, so. Oh. Well, Bond used to eat the entire mouse because I believe he had a very rough childhood. You know, growing up on the mean streets of Thunder Bay. <laughs> <laughs> became such an opportunist tomcat when I got him from the shelter I rescued him um, he did anything he ate broccoli one night oh. I thought, my god a cat that will eat broccoli has seen a rough times. not fussy if it'll eat he'll eat it you know yeah. And that's uh, Jacqueline Decray talking to her. She's from Thunder Bay, Ontario. We're in Radisson, Saskatchewan. And Jackie, if I can call you that, um, started out. Please in, do. Started out in Thunder Bay, correct? Yes, a born and raised here. Yes. And uh, you say that the milk was still delivered by horse and buggy. Well, not a buggy, um, a wagon. <laughs> a wagon, yes. <laughs> Well, yeah, um, I would sneak out of the house before anyone was awake and run down to the end of the street, which is like three blocks. But when you're three years old, it's a bit of a run. <laughs> and then along would come, clip, clop, clip, clop, Big Jim, uh, the chestnut uh, milk horse uh, for Kellogg's. He'd stop. The milkman would say, hi, Jackie. Want to ride? Yeah. <laughs> hoist me up on top of Jim and... I'd ride all the way home. An absolute queen on her steed. <laughs> so, and then they caught me. Oh, no. The parents. Oh, the, the parents. parental unit, yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, I thought maybe you would Rode just... up one day. Pardon? I thought you would just take in the milk and that would be it. No. <laughs> no, I, you know, I was so proud of myself being on that big horse. I was thrilled. I was a knight in shining army. I was a armor. I was a princess. And here we pull up, and here's my mom, my gram, and the next door neighbor all standing there. And their mouths are that big O. Have you ever seen that painting by Munch called The Scream? Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what their mouths looked like. <laughs> what are you doing on that horse, Jackie? Anyway, that was the end of my horseback riding. Oh, darn it! But for not, a while, for a while, because uh, you have the uh, horses played a big part in your life uh, from pretty much then on. Is that not right? Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, I had to get out in the world and get enough training and uh, to earn enough money to be able to afford a horse. Um, and I did, I did. So. Um, Go ahead, I'm stepping on you. Oh, that's okay. It happens all the time. So after various uh, and thundery adventures and uh, university in Winnipeg, uh, you ended up at Lone Mountain College, and that was in the uh, San Francisco area. Uh, One of your... Mm -hmm. Now, was Nicolas Cage a classmate or just an alumnus? Not just, but... He was an alumnus of the San Francisco Repertory Theater School. And um, I had been lured into the drama department with talk of lush scholarship money, 
which I needed, so I became a drama major, reneging my English major, and um, I had to take acting. Well, I thought, oh, God, help me, please. I, I can't do that. Well, I did it, and I found out I could act. So my uh, head of the department enrolled me in this audition for 200 people. Uh, 200 people auditioned. UCLA, Berkeley, Stanford, the big guns, right? Right. And then me, <laughs> the lone mountaineer. <laughs> and I won. I won a year's free training at that same school that later Nicholas Cage would go to. Wow. So, yeah, yeah, yeah I couldn't believe it. I, my, uh, the head of my department, Scott McCann, was just hopping up and down with joy <laughs> to beat the big guns, you know? <laughs> right, that's great. But then you became a you worked in Alaska at an ad agency. You moved to New Orleans at uh, New Orleans, and you call that your spiritual home. Why is that? New Orleans is the most tolerant city I've ever experienced. Um, San Francisco is famous for being tolerant, but I lived there for three years, and it is. But nothing, nowhere is as tolerant as New Orleans. And I always have been the odd man out, the weirdo, the strange person, the, the kid that, you know, does, reads off a bunch of books and, you know, uh, that, that weird kid. So, um, I decided very early that I would be tolerant of people. And this was a very selfish decision. If, I would be tolerant of them, I read, that they would be tolerant of me. It doesn't work that way, Dennis. <laughs> no, it seems not to. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, and you had a successful career of making films and documentaries, uh, won an award uh, or two down there, a national award for a product, a production about uh, beach litter. And wrote all a, washed up, all washed up. Yep, and uh, that was the title. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, a column hoofbeats about horses. You were named the horse woman of the year, and that leads us to um, books: uh, Hot Blooded Murder, uh, Between Extremities. Now, was that your first book, Between Extremities? Yes, that was my yeah, my debut novel. Yeah. Um, small press, but it got critical, really good critical recognition. I didn't sell many books. I, I mean, I didn't sell enough books to really make a living at it. No. Uh, because my publisher didn't have the, the clout, you know, that their authors interviewed by the big guns, by the New York Times, and, you know, those papers put you on the map when you're reviewed, you know, at the New York Times, a good review. The New York Times. So um, I'm coming out of the gate now with my third book, and I'm going for the big guns. I know it ends up, but um, the time is now, the time is here. I'm getting help, professional help. I found out I've been trying to get published by a big gun all wrong. You know, they no longer will look at you unless you have an agent. Uh -huh. And it's difficult to get an agent, so I'm taking a course in how to get an agent. Um, the um, tentative title of this new novel is House of the Rising Sun. Uh, which is a, what is that, right? Which is associated with Pardon? that's associated with New Orleans in a roundabout way. Yeah, just well, completely. To, just to say, yeah, there's what? a house in New Orleans. Yeah, they call the Rising Sun. Right. Okay? Yeah. Henry, yeah. get out of here. My cat's bothering me. But that's what <laughs> What's your cat's name? <laughs> Henry. Henry. Oh, Henry. Okay. <laughs> we have James and Henry. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the other books, um, Hot-Blooded Murder, and that's a Bryn Wiley mystery. Now, are, horse, my, are horses yeah. involved in that one at all? <laughs> um, totally. Um. Rin, who is a native of Thunder Bay, by the way, and has lived in New Orleans for a long time, is a writer, um, goes looking for the owner of a Morgan breeding farm, Morgan Horse, whose farm she's writing an article on. 
And she gets to the farm and can't find uh, Marcy, the owner of the farm, and oh. goes looking. And um, I don't want to give it away. No, but she finds something. Grizzly, grizzly, grizzly. One, one, yeah. one thing leads to another, and ooh. ooh. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you find when you're writing a mystery, let's say? What are the important elements that uh, all stories of that kind should have? Well, since I've only written one, well, I've written one and a half, and halfway through the next one. Um, really important thing to have in a mystery, if you can work it in, is the ticking clock. Make it imperative that your hero solve the crime or something horrible hap will happen within a certain time frame, like I gave Bryn four days to find the murderer, the real murderer. Oh. Because in four days, they're going to give this prize stallion a lethal injection. Oh. Because they think he is the bad guy. Oh. And so she's got four days, tick, 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 tick you know, right. to save the horse's life. Oh. So instead of just sprawling all over the place, you sort of, uh, your your theory is to fine-tune it or narrow it down to, like you said, a certain pathway where things have to happen before day X. Otherwise, terrible stuff will happen. Is, is that kind of the exactly, idea? Exactly, exactly. Ah, okay. And if you look at all of the great mystery writers, um, Agatha Christie, I can't even say, my mind goes blank. There's so many great, great mystery writers Fairly often, they will include that to think lock. Right. So. Well, like, um, oh. uh, then there were one, or then there was one, the one with 10 people on an island, and they get bumped off one by one. So, yeah, you're wondering <laughs> yeah. Who, who's going to be next <laughs> and who's doing it. Yeah. So that's yeah. interesting. How about your your memoir here, fetching A Fetching and Courageous Memoir by an Eloquent eloquent woman. I can't talk. My lips are frozen. It's only minus 30, so. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't worry about saying that title right. I can't use it. It was given to me by that great author, Canadian author, Charlie Wilkins, um, who's had something like 14 or 15 books published, and is sort of is a dear friend and my mentor. But he came up with that title. But it sounds self-aggrandizing. I'm calling myself eloquent. Right. So. How dare I? You know, <laughs> Charlie's calling that eloquent, but it's, the point of view is wrong. Um, so now my title, is, I've, on the advice of my get an agent person, she said, why not make it so long? Make it a trilogy. So I've got book one, book two, book three, and book one I'm tentatively calling There Are No Dinosaurs in the Bible. And book two is Walking Down Bourbon with a Drink. Yep. And book three is When You Know, You Know. You Know. When You Know, You Know. And what have you found now? What did you find when writing a memoir? Certain rules you should follow or not? I'm sorry, what? Uh, when you're writing a memoir, are there certain things you think uh, every memoir should have in it, or can you cannot hold back? So, well, I um, decided to be um, brutally honest. And um, Stephen King warns writers: if you're going to tell the truth, be prepared to never be accepted in polite society again. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm, I'm already a black sheep, so you know, what, what more, you know? So what? Let it, I'm letting it all hang out. I tell the truth. Good. And um, some people won't like it. They won't like it. Well, if it's and a I, story... I even tell the truth when I look bad, you know? Yep. Oh, right. I know. Because if it's your story, then you have to include, in my mind, everything my, that happened. Yeah, with... my screw-up, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Good, with there was a multitude. <laughs> good, bad, or indifferent. It's and if it hurts or bothers other people in the family, well, it's not their story, and uh, it's that's your, exactly right. It's Thank your story, you. and that's mm -hmm. how you remember things. And everybody has different memories, so they think mm -hmm. they're right. Mm -hmm. but we all think we're right, and though the other person or 
relatives might not think you're right, but still, that's what's in your mind. So I guess that's what you have to run to. So what's your uh, daily routine, uh, Jackie, Jacqueline Dacre, back there in the uh, Thunder Bay area? What do you do from day to day? Um, every morning early, sometimes anywhere from 5 a.m. to 6, something like that, I get a cup of coffee. And I crack open my laptop and I write. I write until I, I'm too tired to write anymore. Sometimes that's two hours. Sometimes it's eight, ten, twelve hours. Um, but I have a problem, Dennis, that I am really struggling with. I have vertigo and it makes you dizzy. It gives you brain fog. It makes it very difficult to write, to think. So I'm working on finding a cure, a healing for that. I've gone through my gone to five different doctors. They've tried all different things, and so far we haven't hit on the thing that's going to fix me. So I'm not dizzy all the time, you know, like literally and <laughs> emotionally. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was speed. My my writing has slowed down because of the vertigo. And if anybody out there. Know the care for vertigo. Please tell me. Pass it along. <laughs> uh, yeah. ja- Jacqueline Dacre, you have a, a website up there. What can you tell us? How can we find you and your books? If you can spell my name, which is a challenge, it's Jacqueline Dacre, all one word, all lowercase, dot com. And it is J A C Q U E L I N E. D apostrophe A C R E. No, no apostrophe. No, no apostrophe. apostrophe. Oh, not on the website. Not on the website. No. No apost. There, see, we learn something every day because uh, I guess that's right. And then it comes up with your home, author, books, blog, and how to contact you. So we'll pass that on. It's Jacqueline Dacre, J A C Q U E L I N E D A C R E, all one word. And uh, that's where you'll find her website and her life story and even pictures of some horses. And <laughs> in Kuwait, you were in Kuwait. You you were. In, I'm sorry, what? You were in Kuwait with a Arabian mare. Yeah. How, how'd that yeah, come selling, about? Selling horses. Oh. It was the most wonderful experience. I was there for about three months. I was there by the invitation of the deputy minister for agriculture, because the Kuwaitis have a an Arabian horse breeding program that was decimated by the Iraqis and they are buying, uh, having to go out of the country to buy horses to build up their herd. They had 120 horses when the Iraqis attacked when they finally left, there were 17 horses left. So it was a heartbreaking story. The Iraqis shot, tortured the horses and, uh, I made very good friends with a vet there. He took the big stallion, the main stallion, through the streets that night past patrols, dangerous as hell, to a, bill, a place, a home that had a high, high wall, and then put the horse there and kept the horse alive for two years by sneaking in at night to care for him. Wow. And he saved, he saved the horse. Yeah, a heroic man. Um, it gives me chills to think about him, how oh, wonderful wow. he was, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That sounds like another good story right there. Multitude of stories, Dennis. Thank God. <laughs> stories just keep... keep. I haven't written book three yet of uh, my memoir. Oh, right. So I'm still living it. Uh, I'm yes. watching to see what's going to happen next. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. Okay, well, I unfortunately... Uh, Ms. Dacre, I have to wrap things up. Um, I have another call coming in, which was unexpected to me, but uh, that's the way it goes. So um, we'll tell people to go to the website, which we spelled out. Uh, we'll put it in the, the uh, heading when we get to posting it. And then if there's, uh, like you say, a cure for vertigo out there, uh, <laughs> perhaps we can find yeah. one. And. <laughs> And, we'll, we'll, and dip in the between extremities. It's, it's a hot book. Uh, it's a book for grown ups. Oh, if sex scenes scare you, don't get it. <laughs> Stay away from it. Okay. But if you like good sex scenes, get it. All right. <laughs> okay. okay. We'll be in touch. Well, Dennis, you're wonderful. Well, so are you. 
<laughs> so <laughs> th thank you, and uh, we'll be in touch for uh, another one maybe in a while. You never know. It'll be lovely. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for visiting with us today. This is Talking Books and Stuff with Dennis Rimmer. Contact him at dennis at talkingbooks.tk. Thank you, and may all the good news be yours. Oh, and don't forget to check out his book, The Great Canadian Notebook, available across Canada and at amazon.ca. Oh, oh.